Hello, everybody. Can you guys let me know how my sound is? Make sure you guys can hear me. Just wait for a minute. Make sure you guys can hear me well. Make sure my mic is on. My mic is saying it is on and it is picking up sound. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So today, okay, good. You can hear me. Wonderful. So today uh, we're going to talk about the um, 10 types of, yay, you made a life, yay. Um, we're going to talk about the 10 types of service dogs. And uh, according to dogster.com, which is the in the top three most popular dog websites of 2023, and this was posted as of December 13th, 2023. Um, the first one, number one, guide dogs. Um, these are used by uh, those with visual impairments. Typically, these are lab uh, Labrador retrievers and golden retrievers, um, but not always. And that's typically because these breeds are well suited for um, these tasks, uh, mostly because their size um, and their strength, their build makes them really good for uh, these tasks. Um, number two, hearing dogs used by uh, those with hearing impair impairments. Uh, again, labs and goldens are traditionally used, but um, cockers, cocker spaniels, poodles, and terriers um, are beginning to be seen for uh, for use in this task, as well as many uh, rescues are being used and trained for this task. Um, number three, mobility assistance um, used by those with mobility issues like myself, um, can be used, uh, can be any breed. It's not breed specific. Um, typically our um, medium to large breed dogs that are strong enough to brace, balance, or pull the person who is using that dog. Diabetic alert, number four, diabetic alert used by those with diabetes. Um, again, not a breed specific uh, dog's Usually it's, it's uh, a dog that is known for having a great sense of smell because they sense or they smell the chemical changes um, in blood sugar and will alert to those uh, changes before uh, dangerous levels are reached. Um, number five, seizure alerts. This one can be a little bit controversial. Um because there are those on both sides of the argument um, that dogs can't predict seizures. And then there's there are those that are on the other side of the argument that dogs can predict and can put the handler in safer situations and environments. So um, this one's a little bit of a controversial. Um, Dog trainers and families are more on the side that that the dog can predict 
just before seizures happen and get the handler to the ground before a seizure actually happens so that the handler is not falling and injuring themselves due to those falls. Whereas there are more scientists saying that they can't predict. However, I kind of fall in the middle. Um, it takes a very special dog. I've seen some dogs that can alert and a handler is on the floor before a seizure hits. Um, I can understand how it could happen. So, so I kind of fall in the middle. Um, number six is seizure response. And this would be a dog that is trained to assist the handler during and after a seizure. Um, that is alerting others in the area by barking, um, you know, getting somebody to assist the handler, um, propping legs up, um, performing DPT, which is deep pressure therapy to arouse or uh, the handler sooner after a surgery or uh, seizure, um, you know, just keeping the, the handler calm as they're coming out of a seizure, you know, so that's seizure response. Number seven, a psychiatric service dog. These are dogs that assist those with mental health issues and concerns. Again, this is what my dog does. So my dog is a dual purpose dog. She's mobility and psychiatric. Number eight, autism support. Um, this is uh, typically uh, children and teens. Uh, younger people tend to have uh, autism support. Um, number nine, fetal alcohol spectr spectrum disorder. Um, the, these dogs are assistants with complications with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, similar to autism support dogs. And number 10, allergy detection dogs, often paired with children. Um, these dogs can sniff out potentially deadly allergens and alert, avoiding unnecessary medical expenses. So we'll kind of go through. Um, Many of these these dogs are um, assistance dogs, uh, and and many of these issues are are what many of us that live with disabilities. Um, many of our disabilities are invisible disabilities. So, without our dogs, we we don't have you know a normal life. But then you say, what is normal? <laughs> Um, we don't have ease of life. We don't have independence. We have to rely on those around us that know what, um, you know, our issues are and what our limitations are. So having access to these dogs really gives us an independence in life. In some cases, it gives us a safer life, um, you know, a, a seizure response or, or a seizure alert for, for those that truly can detect seizures before they happen. Um, you know, there's cardiac alert dogs as well that, that, you know, can detect changes in blood pressure, you know, before, before somebody passes out and faints, you know, that's, that's one that's not on here. Um, that, that is very important. You know, they can detect you know, slight changes in in the the blood pressure and and heart rate um, that would be that would happen before somebody were to pass out or faint and and fall and and hurt themselves. You know, so this is this is a way having these dogs is a way for us to be able to live a more independent life. Um, and, and to live a safer life. Um, for me, I live in such a small area, you know, and I always say it, I am in a unique position. If I were to live in a, in a big city, they wouldn't know who I am. They wouldn't know what my limitations are. And, and to walk into a store, I, I would not have the little bit of comfort that I have that, that people know who I am. And, you know, if I were to fall, 
and knock myself out on the corner of a shelf, I would be terrified that somebody would, you know, take advantage of that situation. You know, living in the area where I live, I don't have to worry about that as, as badly because people know who I am living in this small of a community. They'll, they'll be the first ones. Hey, you know, Jen fell and knocked her, knocked herself out, you know, call her best friend. I'm not going to say my best friend's name, but you know, call B BFF to come get the kids. And, you know, I'm going to call the ambulance to come pick her up and take her to the hospital. You call her husband at work, you know, that's the kind of community that we live in. But if I were in the city, they wouldn't know who to call. They wouldn't know what to do. And, and it's a higher chance that I would be taken advantage of. So having my dog, it's less likely that I'm going to have that happen to me. So I'm spreading the awareness and spreading the word so that people know that these dogs are not just pets to us. This is a way for us to be able to live and be able to do what we need to do and, you know, be able to live freer um, with less risk, less chances that we're going to have issues that put us in unsafe situations. Um, you know, these are invisible diseases and conditions and issues that we live with every day. If you don't have these same issues, you don't understand the struggles that we deal with. You don't understand how hard it is for us to just leave our house sometimes and, and do what needs to be done. You know, we don't go out in public every day looking for a fight. We don't go out in public every day looking for an argument. And we understand a lot of times how hard it is for you guys as, you know, people who don't understand and for the businesses that have to deal with all the fake service dogs and the untrained pets that are brought in every day. We get it. We have to deal with it too because it distracts our dogs from doing their job. You know, we get it because you're not the only ones that have to deal with it. We deal with it too. You know, and, and distracting our dogs as she's over there playing, you know, distracting our dogs could cost us much more than, you know, you being inconvenienced. It couldn't, it couldn't cost us. I could fall because she doesn't balance me. She misses a balance because she's being distracted by an untrained dog. You know, so I could fall. Somebody else could come in contact with a deadly allergen because their dog is distracted and, you know, misses an alert for a peanut allergy. So a child could end up in the hospital, you know. So, I mean, it's important. It's, it's not a game to us. So... Invisible diseases and conditions and issues that we deal with every day. These dogs are our lifeline to the outside world in some cases. You know, the, the guide dogs. How are you to know somebody is blind or has visual impairments to the point where they need the assistance of a guide dog? We don't. You know, they don't wear a sign that says, I'm blind on their shirt, usually. Same with a hearing aid dog. Don't wear a, a sign on their shirt that says, I'm deaf or I'm hearing impaired. You know, mobility assistance. That one's half and half. Um, mobility assistance. Sometimes they're in a wheelchair. Um, sometimes they're not. Um, I use Mona for mobility assistance. Um, I don't use a cane. I don't have any other outward signs that I have mobility issues. So, you know, 
some people do have outward signs that they have mobility issues. Some people don't. Um, diabetic, diabetic alert. Most people that struggle with diabetes don't have outward signs that they have diabetes. Um, seizure alert and seizure response. Same thing. Most people that struggle with seizures do not have outward signs of it. Um, psych psychiatric service dogs. Again, that is a mental health um, service dog. Most people that have um, issues with mental health, we don't have, um, you know, any outward, uh, you know, noticeable differences that, that says they have mental health issues. Um, that's why they have their service dog. So, you know, you're not going to know why we have that service dog. Again, you know, autism support, um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. More often than not, you're not going to know just by looking at that person why they have that service dog. So you don't, you know, it, and the same thing with aller um, allergy detection. We don't wear signs that says why we need those dogs. But they are the only way that we can live a safe, productive, free life. And we need to have those dogs. So we'll go through the comments real quick. So I'm so glad you guys have made it. Kim, and is that Monera? Retired Red, Heifer. You're listening, okay. Oh, and Kim, I did see your comment. I haven't responded yet on uh, my other video that I uploaded, but I do have uh, some thoughts. So, thank you so much for this education as sorely needed in society. Yes. Um, and, and that's kind of why I wanted to talk about it because I wanted, I wanted to, to mention, you know, just kind of the top 10. I mean, there, there's more than, than just the top 10. Um, but, but these are really kind of the top 10 most common um that you, you that you see um as far as the types of of service dogs um and and i really wanted to make make it apparent that most of them if not 99 i mean most of them are for invisible diseases invisible conditions and issues because most people think that you have to be visibly, physically disabled for a service dog. And that is so not the case. Um, I, I, I see it all the time that, that those who look normal are harassed but those who may be in a wheelchair or with a cane you know or or and i'm not disrespecting the, them at all by any sense of the word um but the vast majority of service dog handlers have invisible conditions and and that's what makes part of what makes it so hard because we get hassled so much more often. And I understand why. I absolutely do. Um, but the general public needs to understand that the vast majority of service dog handlers are going to have invisible conditions. I mean, I'm not saying that that those in wheelchairs or with mobility devices or, you know, anything like that don't get ha hassled because um, they do. I know they do. 
Um, but but it's much more often that that those with invisible conditions get hassled a lot more. And I understand why. Um, but we, I personally feel that that the general public at large needs more education that the vast majority and, and more often than not, um, a service dog handler will have a an, an invisible condition prompting the need for a service dog. And if we start educating the general public to that, then in a positive way, instead of just trying to jam it down their throat, if we educate in a positive way, then I think it will go a lot further to opening the door to positive communication. I'm going somewhere tomorrow and I'm taking my little furry with me. He'll stay in the car as the weather is good, but he'll be with me on my drive so I don't overthink it. That's wonderful. And that's a great start. If he's not a full service dog, that's a great way to still be able to have the, you know, have him um, with you to help you work through if he's not a full-blown service, but is an ESA, that's a great way to meet in the middle. That's perfect. Perfect. I have hypermobility. It just has not gotten that bad yet. That's, yeah. Yeah. It is not fun. It is not fun at all. Uh, I am sorry, but I totally, totally hear you because that's, that's where I'm at. Um, I do have hypermobility. Min J Ray. I will try to remember that, but I am not great with names. Dog names? I'm good. People name? Not so good, but I will try to remember that. I watched the, oh, Rudy. Oh, oh, he was absolutely precious. Oh, I have to send the link over to his mama. She's going to be happy. No pressure. I'm not trying to, oh, no, 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 Kim, you're fine. Um, but, but I do have some, some thoughts on, on poodle information that might actually help you um, make some sense for you. So, um, when we're done with this, uh, we can move right into that. Um, no problem at all. I worked with a former secretary for the nation of the blind. Their dog was a black lab. She was very well. Yes. Um, and, and so, so there are a couple like the, the, um, um, guide dogs and, and hearing dogs that tend to be a little bit more breed specific, whereas some of the other ones are not. And that's just simply because um, classically and traditionally they started with those breeds um, and, and they kind of stuck with those breeds and they found certain lines, bloodlines that they kind of stuck with and, and just traditionally have stayed within those lines, um, those breeding lines. Um, and they found that size wise um temperament wise strength wise those breeds worked really well for that line of work so they kind of traditionally kind of stayed with those breeds for those tasks um that's that's the only reason um but they in some cases they did start straying a bit um but tra traditionally you would still s stay kind of in those breeds for those tasks question do you or do you recommend um you have a couple you have a couple of options that you can do you can wear a bracelet if you have um a service dog you can special order some patches and and have it put on your vest on your dog um or you can wear 
you know, a strap or, or something like that and have it embroidered on, on that strap or something like that. So there's a couple ways that you can approach that. Um, if you are a regular to certain, um, stores, you can speak with management in those establishments so that they have an idea of things that, you know, if you have certain issues or anything like that, um, you can have management um, of those establishments. They have an idea of what you need done. Um, if you are a regular at those establishments, like if you go to a certain grocery store all the time, that's the only one you go to and you don't normally stray, a certain convenience store that you go to that's like down the street from your house, and that's really the only one you go to, you can talk to management and have a, a game plan with management on, on hand. Um, or like I said, if you do have a service dog, you can have um, uh, some vests have pockets, and you can have a, a patch custom made that says, important information here and you can, or, or you can have a patch made with that impo important information on it. Um, so there are different uh, ways to approach that, that you can absolutely do or wear a bracelet or something like that. Absolutely. But yeah, you could absolutely do that. Oh, that's, <laughs> I remember you made that comment the other day. Yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I've only seen him the one time. I think he's a Labradoodle, if I'm not mistaken. And if I want, I want to say he's like six or seven, maybe eight months old. So him's a good boy. He was a doll. Um, my thoughts on doodles. <laughs> Doodles are dogs. So of course I love them regardless. Um, I love any dogs. Uh, but I think the doodle craze has gotten a little out of hand overall. Um, you know, it's bad when the man who originally created the doodle says he made a mistake. Um, now I don't know if how much you guys know about doodles and how they originally came about. Um, there was, I forget if he was Australian or, or, but, but there was a gentleman that was trying to help a gentleman with a service dog, but he was, or a woman and her husband was severely allergic to dogs or something along those lines. I don't remember all the details particularly. I have I have a two-legged child trying to sneak downstairs. Hold that thought. Yes, love. <laughs> she says, dang it. What you need, babe? Yes, put put a hoodie on because it is starting to cool off. You can say hi quickly. Hi. All right. Love you. Love you. Make it quick though. Notes. Kick rocks. Love you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. I can't see that. I know it's backwards. <laughs> oh, Kim says hi. Aunt Kim? No. Another Kim, not Aunt Kim. Okay. Put a hoodie on. All right, make it quick though. If she wants to. Okay, no fighting though. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so uh, anyways, there was somebody, one party needed a service dog and either that party or the other spouse need was severely allergic to dogs. Um, so he crossbred a doodle and if I'm not mistaken, it was either a golden doodle or a labradoodle for the hypoallergenic, but the traits of the cross. And he had to cross for the doodle like 
10 times before he even got one that was hypoallergenic. And FYI, you have to test in a laboratory individually each dog to verify if the dog is hypoallergenic. Just a FYI. Um, and it was, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it, that is how the doodle came about. Um, and that's, that was in the fifties or sixties, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and that was honestly how the doodle came about. Um, it was for the trainability of one breed and for the hypoallergenic of, an, of the, do, of the poodle. But he had to breed so many times just to get one dog that was actually hypoallergenic um, for the one that was allergic to not have a reaction. Um, and ended up regretting breeding doodles. Um, so I, it is what it is. There is no going back from the doodles. Um, overall, they're dogs. I love dogs. Um, I love all dogs. It doesn't matter. Um, I mean, I just, I love dogs. I, I love dogs. So, um, to me, they are just dogs. I'm not a fan of some of the people who try to promote them. Um, falsely, I'll say it that way. Um, if you are going to promote doodles, do so truthfully. Do not promote them saying they are hypoallergenic. They are not. Um, do not promote them saying that they don't shed. They do. You know, that is my biggest issue with the whole doodle thing. Um, they, they are not what a lot of um, breeders try to say they are. Um, they, they do shed. Um, they, they still, I, I actually have a video, um, of in my uploaded videos that that's, uh, it's called doodles, doodle talk, where I go over some, some of this, they, they, um, yeah, I go over a lot of this. So you can definitely go there and get some more information because I go over a little bit of poodles. I go over a little bit of some of the most common crosses that they use for doodles. So that is my biggest issues with doodles is not actually the dogs that I have issues with. It's a lot of the breeders that I have issues with and not being truthful about doodles. Um, Oh, okay. And I, yes. And, uh, in case of an emergency packet, I was just trying to figure out how you would balance that with your privacy. Um, mm, that's interesting. Yes. You could look into something. Um, You could do a private online page, like a Dropbox document or a OneDrive document and create a QR code for it. So all they do is scan the QR code in case of emergency. That way you don't have a piece of paper with your private information. 
think about something like that. It's less likely that people will, because if the QR code gets dropped in like a parking lot or something like that, especially in a store, people are going to think it's a QR code off of an item in the store, and they're less likely going to scan it. Um, whereas a piece of paper or a folded piece of paper, they're more likely to pick it up and read it. I would look into something like that. That's an idea. I would think about that. I was told they will use a poodle for people who have allergies instead of, yes. All right. And the reason for that um, is because poodles, um, poodles still shed, but less so more than a lab. A lab is a full double coated dog. It, and a double coat just means that, um, yes. Mm -hmm some hot chocolate. I didn't mean to bother you. You're fine. Yes, you may. Okay. I'm making you some ramen because I'm shaky. Okay, get something to eat. I know. But not too much because I'll be cooking supper I know. here in a little it's bit. Just one pat. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, so my oldest. You. You're fine, babe. Um, so um I turned your light on too. Okay, honey. Um so double coat just means that they will shed out their entire coat for one season in preparation for the next season and do so again when the seasons change again. So that's just a double coat. Um, poodles don't do that. Um, so so all dogs are allerg have allergens. They have hair and they have dead skin that they shed dander. So all dogs will have, it's just a matter of how much. The less they shed, the less allergens they have. And that's what it comes down to. No. Um, when I'm talking about doodles, I am, when I use the word doodles, I'm talking about any of the crossbreeds. Um, when I'm, when I'm talking about a specific type of doodle, I'll, I'll generally talk about that specific doodle. Um, if I'm referring to Labradoodles or Golden Doodles or Bernadoodles, I'll, I'll usually specifically say that type of doodle. But if I'm just referring to doodles in general, I'll, I'll typically use the word doodles. No undoodling. Yeah, no, I'm good with doodles. They, they typically in general don't bother me. Um, like I said, my biggest issue is is more in um breedy breeders in my experience let me clarify that in my experience a lot of of breeders that i have dealt with people who have bought dogs um a lot of them have not been a hundred percent truthful and that Torx manoodle a little bit. Doodles can be high energy. Um, so, so I'm going to put a pin in that because that goes a little bit with what I want to come back around and talk about poodles with Kim with. So I'm going to stick a pin in that. It also sounds as if there's been some unresponsible. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. And, and actually, I talk about that a little bit in my Doodle Talk video. Um, so it looks with. Oh, okay. Um, so, okay. I think this is a good, good place where. Uh, we can, unless we have any other questions about any of the types of, of service dogs, we'll give that a second and then we'll go into some of the poodle talk. doesn't look like it, but I'll give you a second longer.
All right. It doesn't look like it, but I will keep an eye out just in case anything pops up. All right. So poodles. And and I'm I'm gonna kind of blow y'all's mind because <laughs> most people don't know this. Um, poodles are not fr a French breed. Most people think they are. They're a German breed. Um, they originated in Germany, um, and they are actually a hunting dog. They are water retrievers. Um, so. The first poodle was the standard, and it's assumed and theorized that they originated as a crossbreed between a um, European water dog and another, some unknown dog. Um, and when... And, and the classic traditional show cut of a poodle where they have the puffs on the rump, the big poofies on the, on the ankles, the big poof around uh, the rib cage. There's actually a purpose to that haircut. Um, that was the traditional hunting cut because they are water retrievers and they are European dogs. Most European open waters are ice cold because they're mountain runoff. Um, and because they're water retrievers, they, they have naturally curly hair. Once that water is, or once that hair gets wet, it kinks up and curls up. And it traps, naturally traps air up against the skin when they are in the water. So it naturally insulates the major joints, and the major organs against the cold, icy waters. They're bird retrievers. So they started as a standard and then bred down for the miniature, which is medium, then bred down again for the toy, or um, yes, toy, then bred down again for the teacup. So the standard, which is the large one, the largest, bred down, they were water retrievers, bred down for the miniature, which were used in as, as um, like circus performers, um, you know, because they were a bit smaller, but they're very intelligent, high energy dogs, um, fast learners, and they are people pleasers bred down again for the toys which were used for truffle hunting absolutely it sounds absolutely crazy in today's standards but back then it was absolutely utilitarian yes absolutely um, but the toy breeds were actually, or the, the toy size is, were used as truffle hunters. Remember, these are hunting dogs. They have a nose like no other. But the size was great for them to be able to get into tight spaces, small holes made from rabbits and other, you know, small creatures in the underbrush and hunt truffles. And then the toy breed, or the toy size, which is under 10 inches tall, standard lap dog. And that is the only one that was developed in France. The rest of these were actually German dogs. Crazy. So poodles are actually very high energy dogs. And they need to be exercised. Now we're going to come back a little bit to some of the doodle talk. Um, and, and this is why sometimes most people don't know. And this is why 
a lot of doodles get a bad rap and a lot of poodles get a bad rap because people don't know that poodles are a hunting breed. They have, they are a high energy, high drive dog. On top of you are taking a standard size and you are breeding it down. So you're basically taking the runt and the smallest of each litter and breeding it down and bringing down and breeding down. And you're, what you're doing is you're actually breeding in more issues each time you do that. Not saying that you're not going to eventually get more, you know, get healthy dogs. You will. You too, my dear. We'll see you finish on the replay, my dear. Um, but, but over time, it creates more complications and more issues. But, you know, it, it, they are hunting dogs. They're retrievers. And then... Back to doodle talk a little bit. You bring in the most common breeds that they cross with for doodles are Labrador Retrievers, Golden Retrievers, Old English Sheepdogs, Herding Dogs, Australian Shepherds, Herding Dogs. So more often than not, the breeds that they're crossing with are hunting dogs, are herding dogs. They're all working dogs. So again, you're taking a high energy hunting dog and you're crossing with another high energy working, hunting, herding dog. And a lot of times you end up with a double whammy. What do you think is going to happen? And these the, people think doodle and they have been misinformed. Poodle um, are calmer. No, they're not. They're a hunting dog. They have high energy. They have high drive. And when you're not working that, you end up with a nervous dog. Exactly. And then when you cross it with another dog that has a high energy drive and a high, you know, high energy drive, high working drive, what do you think is going to happen? Exactly. Exactly. That's what happens. And that's why a lot of doodles and a lot of poodles end up getting a bad rap. And it's not their fault. Not their fault at all. They get a bad rap because breeders have misinformed owners that poodles are calmer when in fact they are not. They're not being worked enough to burn off all of that extra drive that they have because they are actually working dogs. We have gone all these, all this time thinking that poodles are foo-foo dogs when in reality they're not. And then you add in the doodle mixes and now you've got a double whammy because most of these doodles, you, you have half that is a working dog the other half is a working dog and the DNA, the literal DNA of these dogs are both working dog DNA. But you have breeders that are saying, oh, poodles are foo-foo dogs. It's going to calm down the lab energy. Labrador Retriever is a water dog. Poodle is a water dog. You just doubled up the energy. That's all you did. 
Exactly. But unfortunately, Kim, what's happening is a lot of these breeders are not telling the, the people who are buying these dogs that. That's, that's my issue with doodles. It's not the dogs that I have issues with at all. I grew mutts all day long. And mutt is not a derogatory term that I'm using at, at all. You know, I it mutt is a mix. Um, I've owned mutts most of my my life. Um, it, it's they need a job. They absolutely need a job. But you have breeders that are misinforming brand new owners. Many of these people have never owned a dog before because they're allergic to dogs. They are misinforming brand new owners that this dog is going to be calmer because it's poodle mix. They're hypoallergenic when they're not. And the only way to prove a dog is hypoallergenic is to test it in a lab individually. That is my problem with doodles, not the dogs. It's nine times out of 10, the breeders. And that is why you see so many doodles in shelters. Because the owners were misinformed or flat out lied to. Any other questions about doodles or poodles? <laughs> I hope that gives you a lot of information about poodles and doodles. Thank you, Red. Yeah, I knew this one wasn't going to be very long. Um, but like I said, I did I did want to just kind of address some of the, you know, the most common types of of service dogs and clarify that the vast majority of the reasons why people use service dogs are invisible diseases and conditions. Um, because like I said, you know, if we can positively communicate with the public then maybe we can start making some positive positive movement in the right direction you know that's that's kind of my goal yes yes they are Now, now poodles much uh, much more so. Doodles, if they are um, poodle confirmation. Um, so, like if if you go back in my in my videos to uh, Lucy and Darby, they are both Burmese Mountain Dog Poodle. So they're Berna Poodle uh, Berna Doodles. Um, Lucy, much more on the poodle side. Darby, much more on the Burmese Mountain Dog side. Darby is a little in a, in a china shop. I love her so much, though. She's so goofy. Um, she is very broad, very thick. Um, she, if she didn't have curly hair, she could absolutely look like a Burmese mountain dog. Um, her hair is very thick. Her body is very thick, very muscular. Um, Darby would not be able to move um, to handle agility. Now, um, I volunteer every summer. I did not this past summer because of my surgery, um, but uh, I volunteer every summer for 4-H, my local 4-H here, and I lead, I am a co-leader for the dog group, and we put on, we practice all summer, and we put on 
a dog show at the end of uh, at the end of the summer. We do rally, showmanship, obedience, and agility. So I know exactly what you're talking about with all the the agility. I mean, we put on a full dog show with the kids every year. Darby would not be able to do very well in agility. Um, she just doesn't have the body for it. Whereas Lucy would. Lucy has got that thinner, more more aerodynamic aerodynamic body um, of the poodle. So she would definitely do a lot better. Um, so yeah, doodles, uh, it depends on what side of, of the, the cross that they take after, but poodles absolutely do really well in agility work. Absolutely. And they love it because it helps them spend and burn off that extra energy that they have. So absolutely. Oh, I know. I can't believe it feels like I just sat down. Um, I'm, I'm still, I, you still see me twitching a lot. So, um, still very nervous, but, uh, I'm, I'm getting much more calm. Um, I, I mentioned it uh, I, I, uh, I'm, um, very passionate about the information that I, I want to share and, and that helps a lot. Um, I, I really want to get this message out. Um, I want to make a positive contribution to the service dog arena. I want to, I want to open the conversation with the general po public in a positive way. Um, I've seen too much animosity um, in the arguments. And I'm just, I'm over it. This isn't just about helping those who may need to understand a little bit more for their own purposes, maybe for their own um, information, their own self. Um, but this is for the other side too. This is for the general public. This is you know, for those who may have questions and, and may not understand why people may have service dogs and, you know, what a service dog really is and what they're for. Th this is to try to make it a positive conversation. Because um, I'm tired of the arguing. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. The world needs a lot more positivity. So that's why. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm just some country bumpkin in the middle of nowhere, but we need a lot more positivity in the world. And I'm just in a really unique position because I can help in a lot of different ways. Um, I know there are a lot of people that need a service dog that just, if they get one that's professionally trained, that's a lot of money. Um, but then the responsibilities that come with having one, a lot of people can't afford that. And that's why, um, part of why I'm making um, some of my other grooming vi videos available. Um, I, I've said it before, I have a different philosophy in the way I do things. Um, I have a different philosophy in the way I run my business. 
Um, I, I am not in business to make a million dollars on my clients in five years. Um, yeah, I make a few bucks, but I may, I make enough to keep the doors open and pay my bills. Um, I try to give as much as I take from my community. I offer free nail clippings. No strings attached. You do not have to be a paying client. You could be u- utilizing somebody else's services in a, one of the other shops in town and still come see me for nail clippings free of charge. Um, I, I don't, I don't expect anybody to utilize any of my paid services in order to get the free nail clipping that's available to anybody and everybody in my community. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I just have a different philosophy. Um, just because I can charge whatever I want doesn't mean I should. Um, I'm all about trying to make grooming affordable and accessible to everybody. Just not, just not who can afford it. All the tips and tricks that, that you have seen me share here is exactly what I share with my clients in real life. Um, my clients think I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. They think I'm nuts. Um, I am notorious for when they want to book their next appointment, especially first timers. Why don't we wait and see when we need to, when, when you think they're getting close, then call me and we'll get you on the books and then we'll see how long that was. That's when we'll make a, a standing appointment. Um, there's no point in coming any sooner than you need to. And, and that's just kind of how I do things. So I'm not normal. That's just how it is. Um, so I have taken the way I run my business and I've brought that here. Um, so I share the knowledge that I have up here with all of you folks because not everybody can afford to go to the groomer once a month. In a lot of cases, you don't need to. Um, so it's, it's, it's what I try to live my life in a way that would make my grandparents proud. And it's what she would have wanted me to do. And she was the inspiration behind me opening my shop. So um, that is the tattoo that is on my wrist is my grandparents. So the elephant, I know it's upside down, but the elephant is my grandmother and the jet is my grandfather. Um, they are the reason they are the reason so they are my reminder so sorry <laughs> i'm sorry um i lost my grant uh, so I opened my shop four years ago, so. Be safe to come down. No, I'm still on. Talking about grandma. So, uh, okay. I'm not. <laughs> um, can I use a red pencil, Dr. Kira? There you go. Because I'm trying to find the boys' gifts. Okay. And I need to ask Kira. Oh, Mona, I'm all right. Ah, uh, I'm all right, but yeah. Don't so do that, to me. that is illegal to make you cry and me cry. 
Yeah, that is why. So I'm all right. So um, I'm sorry. That is why I do what I do. The way I do what I do. So. Oh, yeah. She had to run upstairs real quick to see who was coming in the door. But here she is. You could probably hear her gruffing at me. So, I'm sorry. I did not mean to get emotional, but um, everybody asks me why. And that is why um, my grandmother wanted me for years to talk to me about opening my own place. And uh, she got really sick at the end and was in a special rehab. And um, at the time we are, we were a single income family. I was just grooming kind of on the side, uh, for friends and family. And, uh, I went ahead. I wanted to start helping my aunt who was her caregiver because we'd already, already lost grandpa at this point. Um, I wanted to start helping my aunt financially with things just to try to take some of the stress and pressure off my aunt a bit. And uh, we couldn't do that on a single income. Um, so I uh, saved up and started planning opening my own place. And uh, unfortunately, we lost her and we had her funeral on the Friday before I opened on Monday, August 26th, 2019. And from that moment until this moment right now, I have made it my mission to operate in a way that I give as much as I take and I uh, I do so in a way that would make her proud and that's what I do so I'm sorry. <sighs> I loved that woman more than anything. Still do. <sighs> Thank you. <sighs> no. Thank you. So, and all my craziness, I will always share what I can. And if I don't know something, I will tell you. Um, or I will research it. I will find out. And I will try to give you the best answer I can. But there's a lot of info stuck in this noggin of mine. 20 years I've done this. And for 20 years I have loved it. And I honestly don't think I could see myself doing anything else. I don't think I'd be good at anything else, honestly. <laughs> I have too much fun. Way too much fun. It's not easy, but I, I do enjoy what I do. I love what I do. So. All right. It's a little after four. I got to go make sure everything is 
ready so I can start supper. Hubby will be getting off work at 5, 5.15. You guys are awesome. Really appreciate it. Kind of needed to talk about her. It's been a little while. I appreciate it. Any last minute questions? You guys are welcome. And then Kim, I'm just going to put a little note in your uh, question uh, on my uh, video that uh, they can come pop over here for a little bit more in-depth uh, discussion about poodles and doodles. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure, Red. Everything uh, is usually a bit hectic when Daddy gets home from work. But uh, after supper, everything relaxes again. I feel a bit lighter. It's been a hot minute since I've talked about Grandma. You guys would have liked her. She was something else. All right, guys. I'm going to call it an evening. I'm sure I will see you guys if there's any live chats. I'm sure I will see you guys around. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. I really do. All right. I'll see you guys later.